Under the Portuguese EU presidency, the European Commission has developed a long-term vision for rural areas. A vision that involves people into the design of their future and ensures green and just recovery for all rural areas. ESPON identifies the challenges and the trends for rural areas and links them with the EU Territorial Agenda 2030 and the priorities of the Portuguese Presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to open the ESPON seminar promoted by the Portuguese Presidency and particularly to contribute to an emerging debate in Europe the green and just recovery for all European territories. In fact, having a vision for all European territories is nowadays a huge challenge. The pandemic had such a disruptive impact on our societies that it is impossible to think that any recover or normality means a return to old formulas of Polish governance. It is time to act. We must respond to the deep economic and social crisis we face using knowledge, resilience, co-creation processes and direct involvement of citizens. And we must think strategically <coughs> about what we want, which European house we want to build. Building the European house means, now more than ever, thinking about territories and to do it by responding to climatic, social and environmental challenges. But also to think about the emerge of risks, whether they be pandemic or others. This means involving our citizens, providing their needs and reducing inequalities. The European home we want to live in is an inclusive home, energy efficient, with a culture of diversity and multiculturalism, truly committed to social and territorial cohesion. This is a historical turning point in which both social Europe and green Europe are high on the list of priorities. Reality has shown that without fulfilling social Europe, we do not achieve resilient development and without green Europe, we do not achieve sustainable economic development. <coughs> Let me give you an example about Portugal. We have a serious commitment to the territorial development and circular economy, which we consider a pillar of a new economic order. Making the reuse of resources an instrument to generate new and more skilled jobs is a transverse measure in public policies aiming at the decarbonisation objectives in 2050. We are doing it. Our sustainable development strategy is based on decarbonisation, on energy transition, pursuing a more competitive and resilient development model that values natural resources and with them the natural value present in each territory. Portugal is one of the European countries where climate change has the greatest impact. And this fact, visible from year to year, has generated a national alert that claims, be smart. Therefore, our national program for spatial planning policy has a long-term vision that incorporates the territorial dimension in all sectors and states, that, and states that the territory must be at the centre of public policies. With this concern very much in mind, we have built our recovery and resilience program where we have tried to find true transformation mechanisms for all territories and, most of all, for rural territories. Experience has shown that whenever we put the knowledge and innovation into processes, we benefit in terms of employment and social and territorial cohesion. We gain in social justice and in the valuation of the resources of each territory, whether natural or social. In fact, we win on the balance between the well-being of our communities and the preservation of territorial values. In this context, the teamwork undertaken by the Portuguese Presidency, Presidency and ESPON in preparation for the policy brief on the long-term vision for rural agrees areas is of great relevance. We have the responsibility of being part of a historic moment that implies a profound transformation of society as we know it. 
only with a new model that recognizes the current global threats, changes consumption and preserves and adds value to resources, we will achieve sustainable recovery. The goal set by Portugal to achieve carbon neutrality implies reducing greenhouse gas emission by more than 85% in relation to 2005 and ensuring a capacity for agriculture and forestry carbon sequestration in the order of 13 million tons. We will only be able to achieve this national goal with a sustainable and resilient agriculture and forestry and this path will only be achieved with the full engagement of local populations and the society in general. The new consumer agenda is also our agenda for a more democratic, inclusive, green and digital Europe. The energy transition and the decarbonisation of the economy are an opportunity for Portugal, an opportunity to increase investment, employment and economic growth due to improve competitiveness and sustainability made possible by the energy transition to a carbon neutral and circular economy. An opportunity for scientific innovation and technological progress as the path to carbon neutrality is also the path of knowledge, creativity and innovation. We have no time to waste. This is the road for the future. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Espon broadcasting live from Digital Azul Studio in Lisbon, Portugal. I'm very happy to host this debate today. My name is Viktor Shedarovsky. I'm the director of the ESPON EGTC, the European Grouping for Territorial Cooperation, a single beneficiary and operating body for the EU-funded program called ESPON. During the 90 minutes, a bit less than 90 minutes right now, we are going to talk about a very important subject of transition and transformation for rural areas. And this event is organized with the support of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council. This is an important day for the country. Today, the President of the European Commission, Madame Ursula von der Leyen, is, host, is coming to the country, is paying the visit to Portugal to start approving the uh, national recovery plans. And I'm happy to say that Portugal has been the first EU country to adopt its national recovery plan. I have two eminent panelists with me today, Mr. Vasco Cordeiro, who is the uh, Vice President of the European Committee of the Regions, and Mr. Cordeiro has a profound experience of regional work at the regional level, the work with regional imbalances, the uh, the strategies, the plans, the programs that serve the development of the uh, territories. When being president of the regional government of Azores, and I do believe this was two terms that, you've been the, the, that you were the president, you worked a lot to modernize the economy and support the people of the islands. And thanks to your work, Mr. Cordeiro, Azores entered the international map of classified destinations in nature tourism. And absolutely, you have a solid knowledge of the management of the EU funds. And also, you understand well how to implement the EU programs and also national and regional strategies. And also with me here in the studio, I have Mrs. Anna Sessions, who is a Deputy Director General of the Portuguese National Authority for Territory. And you have a mandate to design, plan and implement the National Spatial Planning Policy Programme. You also serve in the National Intersectoral Forum that aims to put this programme into practice and also to provide a good bond between the various policy sectors in your country. And Anna is also a full member of the ESPON Programme Monitoring Committee. So welcome to this panel. Mr. Cordeiro is going to join us online from the beautiful islands of Azores and we are very thankful to have you with us here today. So, we've heard some important messages from Minister uh, João Pedro Matos Fernandes, Minister for Environment and Climate Action of Portugal. I will just pick up some of the important words here, co-creation, citizen involvement. So, um, this is also quite essential to understand that right now we have the money, we have the plans, we have the visions, 
but we need to know how to implement it in the best way. And before giving the floor to my panelists, I would like to present to you the video message from the Commission, Vice President of the European Commission, Dubravka Szujca, who will present how the Commission works with the long-term vision for the rural areas. Dear Minister Matos Fernandez, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to address ESPON once again in your week of green and just recovery for all European territories. The Commission's work in demography was launched with the report on the impact of demographic change. It was followed in January of this year by the Green Paper on Aging, and the most evident demographic challenge facing the European Union is aging. This is not just a matter for older people. Everyone is impacted directly by the prospect of living a longer life, including the young. This brings both challenges and opportunities. The long-term vision for rural areas will be published at the end of this month. Our vision aims to be greater than the sum of all its parts. The vision is one of our demography initiatives that underpins both a green and just recovery for all, including rural areas and territories. It complements the European Green Deal, that is Europe's growth strategy. The green and digital transitions go hand in hand with relaunching and modernizing our economies. We cannot do this alone. Together, through Next Generation European Union and the Recovery and Resilience Facility, the European Union and the Member States can pinpoint and deliver investment where most needed. We have now entered the key phase of putting the Recovery and Resilience Facility into effect. What matters now is to ensure the high quality and quick rollout of the national plans so that investment financed under Next Generation EU starts supporting the recovery. Next Generation EU will drive the recovery and the just transition. It supports the transformation of cities and regions through new job opportunities in renewable energy and provides secure connectivity infrastructure that will benefit citizens and businesses of all sizes everywhere. The recovery and resilience plans include a variety of measures aimed at fostering the green transition, including biodiversity, and climate-related measures will account for at least 37% of the funding for each national recovery and resilience plan, and all measures must respect the do no significant harm principle. The digital transformation is a key objective of this facility. Digital-related investments will account for at least 20% of the investments. When it comes to the green and digital transitions, these provide opportunities for recovery that values long-term sustainability while embodying inclusion, equality and territorial cohesion. Digi digital technologies are key enablers in our move towards circularity and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It is essential that these benefits are felt in all corners and regions of Europe, including those areas most affected by the transition to climate neutrality. No one can be left behind. And this brings me to my work in demography and the long-term vision in particular. At the end of this month, better to say on 30th of June, we will present our long-term vision for rural areas, which fits with our overall ambition of a green and just recovery. When we speak about rural areas, we mean 137 million people, representing almost 30% of European Union's population and over 80% of its territory. So how could we even think about a just and green recovery without their input? This vision is all about addressing our common challenges together by building jointly on the emerging opportunities of European Union's green and digital transitions and on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. It will help us to identify the means to improve rural quality of life, achieve balanced territorial development and stimulate economic growth in rural areas. The resounding message that came from our wide public consultation is that almost 40% of those who replied said they felt left behind by society and policymakers. 
this perception and the factors driving it must be tackled. Populism usually finds fertile ground in this, con in this content and our recent report on the demographic and landsca landscape of European Union territories, and it demonstrates just how much political attitudes and the electoral behaviors may be shaped and influenced by age and place of residence. Democracy is not static. It constantly evolves. Our democracy must be fit for the future in order to strengthen our representative democracy. This is what the Conference of the Future of Europe is all about, bringing citizens into the heart of policy making, including the 137 million European citizens living in rural areas. The vision will help turn the changes in society, including the latest ones caused by COVID-19, into opportunities for rural areas because we need to avoid an asymmetric recovery and ensure that all of the European Union's territories have the means to bounce back equally from the pandemic. It's all about creating a better future, not only for the rural areas, but together with them, while ensuring they maintain their essential rural character. No two rural areas are alike, so we must harness their diversity and variations in natural and climatic conditions, geographic features, historic and cultural developments, demographic and social changes, national and regional specificities, and economic prosperity. This requires tailor-made responses and solutions that correspond to each territory's specific needs. Rural areas are active players in the European Union's green and digital transitions through sustainable production of food, preservation of biodiversity and the fight against climate change. They play a key role in achieving the European Union's Green Deal, farm to fork and biodiversity targets. In parallel, the rollout of new technologies in rural areas will be indispensable to making Europe's digital decay a reality. Reaching the targets of the European Union's digital ambitions for 2030 can provide more opportunities for the sustainable development of rural areas beyond agriculture, beyond farming and forestry, developing new perspectives for the growth of manufacturing and especially services and contributing to improved geographical distribution of services and industries. The long-term vision bridges gaps and builds synergies between all European policies. This goes way beyond any particular policy or fund. The vision is more about the way we look at rural areas and perhaps more importantly, the way they look at themselves. This is also the genuine value added of the long-term vision to create a new momentum for rural areas by using all the resources available to support the social and economic development of rural areas and make them vibrant, dynamic and attractive. I'm confident that this vision, which is supported by a strong action plan, will equip us with the necessary tools to encourage these regions to become confident, innovative and competitive and to improve the quality of life for their citizens and ultimately to guarantee the green and just recovery we need for Europe. A final point, a request to all of you. Your contribution to the vision is impressive. We need it again in the context of unprecedented exercise in deliberative democracy that is the Conference on the Future of Europe. The voices of the rural communities must be heard in this context too. Go online to our multilingual digital platform, organize events, upload your outcomes on the platform and make your voice heard. I want to thank you very much and I look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you very much. So this is the, uh, the message from the Commission, Vice President Schuitza, on the future of rural areas. And if I may, I would like then to pick up on some important messages that with recovery and resilience plans on the way to be adopted, we need to quickly put them into effect. We need to be smart, we need to deliver on political commitments, we need to do something not for the rural areas, but with the rural areas. And I will start with Anastasius, because you are responsible to implement, for implementing the National Spatial Planning Policy Programme. Could you give us some insight into how to build the right structure to implement this long-term vision for areas, like in Portugal? Do you see a need for multi-level governance? 
do you see a need for some good organization of actions to transform vision into reality? Thank you very much for your question and uh, thank you very much for the invitation for being here. It's an honor and uh, I would like to thank on behalf of the National Directorate for Territory. Uh, yes, uh, I think everything is important at this time. Uh, I would like also to highlight one other message that uh, the Mrs. Vice President uh, told us, that it's our vision aims to be greater than the sum of all parts. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very interesting message because, uh, well, we cannot do or implement any strategy if we don't think that we all need to be part of it. Part of it. Uh, so it's important to plan, it's important to know what way we need to take. And uh, fortunately, we have a plan in Portugal that considers territory in the center of the policies. So we can speak to other political sectors in a way they can understand what we want. And yes, we can understand what they want as well. But we need to, li to listen not only the political se sectors, but also the people that are in all places. And to listen to people, it's to be attentive to their concerns and what they think matters really much. Uh, and I think that uh, it is this connection between the, the strategic planning, not only at the EU level, but also at national level, but how does this, this perspective, these strategic options, go to the, the people that are in those rural areas, in those places, and again, how do the, the, their concerns can go up to, to the Commission and to the European uh, concerns. But I think, yes, I think we have a path. Uh, I think we have a very good opportunity uh, and I think that uh, we need to be attentive, we, li we need to be to learn and to have a strategy to, to move on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now to Mr. Cordeiro. A very important question of how, how to implement, how to leave no one behind and probably um, the question that is essential to be posed for uh, policy makers at regional level is do we have capacities, do we have resources in rural areas among the uh, local and regional governments? Do we have the know-how and do the people understand the message of the Commission and even the messages from the national governments on recovery and resilience plans? What's your reflection on that? Well, good morning to everybody. First, I would like to greet uh, not only um, our moderator, but also my, my fellow speaker, um, Anna Seixas. And I would like to uh, thank you for this opportunity, opportunity on behalf of the Committee of the Regions. And it is in that capacity that I'm here today as first vice president of the Committee of the regions. I think it's, um, well, you have a lot of, of a lot of questions in just one, but let me try to explain. First of all, uh, I think that we must be aware of the opportunity that the current situation uh, represents uh, not only a challenge, of course, but also an opportunity to change. We are not only uh, we're not talking only about recovery, to put things back where they were before the pandemic. What we are talking about is to use this opportunity to change a lot of issues, to reconfigure a lot of issues in our society, in our communities, so we can achieve faster and better a lot of goals that we have set for, uh, for ourselves. Green and just recovery is one of those issues. And the situation of rural areas represents a good challenge for, uh, for this. Now, how can, we, how can we put that in practice? How can we uh, put that working? But I think there are mainly three issues that should be considered and are very, very important for the capacity and the ability of rural areas and their representatives uh, to use this. First, knowledge. 
it's very, very important to increase, to, to go deeper in all the data of subnational level. And um, I think S Fund can play a crucial role. It has played, and it surely it will continue to play a role in providing knowledge, providing data. There is no political decision without data. And I must say that sometimes when I was responsible for, I was in an executive position, sometimes this data, especially put in a broader context of the European uh, Union, is very, very important. So this would be the first thing, knowledge, the mapping of information at subnational level. I think it's key to create a real understanding of what's at stake. Second, empower all levels of governance. And this would lead us to a very interesting discussion. But to empower all levels of governance means not only to, to invite um, national governments to take into account the positions of uh, local and regional authorities, but maybe to go further, maybe to, to have that as, um, as a necessary step so the policies could be better implemented. Why? Well, because it's, it's very simple, the importance that local and regional authorities have in, um, in, in public spending, in, invest, in public investment, in knowing uh, in a more deeper way the reality of those areas. Third, we need sensible legislators. And um, I think all the knowledge that uh, we have must be put in place so we can have right decisions at all levels of uh, governments. And this means, of course, that um, uh, the, the, legis the legislative, and not only the legislative, but also the executive, are very, very important for that. As fun, and I think with the Portuguese presidency is um, probably one of the, uh, Portugal is one of the countries that has a better knowledge of this. We have experience with Portu with uh, uh, the Azores and Madeira and experience of, uh, re of um, autonomous regions with uh, 